Good evening. I'm Toby Jurovics, Curator of Photography, and I'd like to welcome you to the American Art Museum this evening. Um, before we go any further, uh, I'd also like to request that you turn off your cell phones or anything else that might ring or buzz at an inopportune moment. Um, I'd like to begin by extending the museum's appreciation to Clarice Smith for sponsoring the Cl Clarice Smith Distinguished Lectures in American Art. It's always a special treat to have her here with us, and I'd like to thank you for your generosity and uh, your ongoing support. <laughs> Tonight's speaker, Mark Feeney, is the arts and photography critic for the Boston Globe. He's a winner of the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for criticism for, quote, his penetrating and versatile command of the visual arts from film and photography to painting. At the Globe, He's also served as book editor and editor of the weekly section of news analysis and political commentary. His work has appeared in the New Republic, Harper's, the Los Angeles Times, the American Scholar, and the New York Observer. His latest book, Nixon at the Movies, a book about belief published in 2004, was called An Ingenious Study of Nixon's Mythalomania by the London Observer and Transfixing, Transfixing by Vanity Fair. Mark was the 2007 Robbins Professor of Writing at Princeton University, and currently serves as a lecturer in American Studies at Brandeis University. This fall, he is also a lecturer at Yale University. Tonight's talk is titled, Four Photographers on Three Wheels, William Eggleston's Tricycle and Before. Mr. Feeney once wrote, Eggleston places the mundane on stilts. Of course, something placed on stilts is visible from new angles and approaches. All photographs are about seeing, Eggleston's are about seeing afresh. Eggleston's tricycle is one of the contemporary photography's most recognized images. Although rather than placing it on stilts, Eggleston drops his camera low, low to the ground, fills the frame with his childhood icon, transforming it into a colossus that dominates its neighborhood. Having had a sneak uh, peek at Mark's PowerPoint, I can tell you he's about to take us on a harrowing ride to unexpected places. Please join me in welcoming Mark Feeney. Thank you all very much. Toby, thank you. Let me turn this on. That seems to be on. Uh, I want to thank, <clears throat> before I get started, Mrs. Smith, of course, uh, and the Smithsonian staff. As Toby mentioned, this lecture is called Four Photographers on Three Wheels, William Eggleston's Tricycle and Before. It's only after coming up with this title that I noticed the echo of Virgil Thompson and Gertrude Stein's opera Four Saints in Three Acts. Uh, well, as you'll see, it turns out that there are a few religious aspects here, too, though that's getting ahead of things. About that last word in the title, before. Prepositions are so simple, yet often also slippery. Before works in two ways tonight, large and small. Let's start large. Let's see if this works. There we go, there we go. Uh, one way of addressing American photography in the 20th century might be to look at a handful of particular and particularly notable images and consider how they both reflect and shaped their eras, the greatest hits approach, if you will. And you'll recognize all of these, I'm sure. For the first quarter of the century, Alfred Stieglitz's The Steerage. For the second, Dorothea Lange's Migrant Mother. For the third, a book rather than a single image, a mark of both the enduring influence and extraordinary artistry of Robert Frank's The Americans. Finally, there is this, William Eggleston's Memphis, also known as Untitled, or as you might expect, Tricycle. Let's look at them again. Stieglitz's The Steerage, Lang's Migrant Mother, Robert Frank's The Americans. That photo on the cover is Trolley, New Orleans and then the Eggleston. All right, everyone in this room has taken standardized tests. Which one doesn't belong? <laughs> I think you guessed it. Uh, all but the Eggleston immediately summon up obvious larger associations. Each is black and white, for one thing, for so long the classic look of serious photography. Elegant, severe, and implying a commitment to the straightforward documentation of reality. This despite the rather paradoxical fact that black and white conveys less information than color does. With the steerage, one notes an equipoise between complexity and order. 
the affinity with cubism, the acknowledgement of class, recall the title, in an ostensibly egalitarian society, and of course, the way the photograph represents immigration, one of the preeminent themes, maybe the preeminent fact, of American life. As it happens, Stieglitz took the picture on a ship heading to Europe, but that's just another footnote to photography's ongoing demonstration of the truth that while seeing may be believing, seeing is not necessarily understanding. Migrant Mother, which has been called the most famous art photograph of the 20th century, has two obvious and quite profound associations, the Great Depression and Western art's centuries-long tradition of the Madonna and Child. This quartet of examples from the 84 photographs in the Americans gives a sense of the book's unemphatic yet unmistakably mythic quality, and no less important, Frank's radical recasting of American space. All photography is about time, so much of the enduring impact of this book is how much it's about space as well. Its title notwithstanding, Frank's book isn't so much about the people shown in it as the space that contains them. As for the Eggleston, well, uh, juxtaposed with these other photographs, it wouldn't be surprising perhaps if you responded with the famous first line from Greil Marcus's Rolling Stone review of Bob Dylan's 1970 album, Self Portrait. What is this shit? In fact, the 1976 Museum of Modern Art exhibition in which it appeared, William Eggleston's Guide, received its share of uncomprehending reviews. What might have been the most withering appeared in the New York Times. Hilton Kramer wrote it. Hilton Kramer may well be Greil Marcus in a parallel universe, a description both men, I suspect, might welcome. Perfectly banal and perfectly boring, Kramer wrote, playing off of Eggleston's photographs being called perfect by MoMA's curator of photography, John Tchaikovsky. Instead of perfection, Kramer saw, quote, dismal figures inhabiting a commonplace world of little visual interest. All right, let's apply that description to Eggleston's tricycle. Dismal, that's a subjective judgment, of course. Commonplace, yes, and proudly so. Of little visual interest, not hardly. On closer examination, Eggleston's tricycle ramifies and resonates as the Stieglitz, Lang, and Frank photographs do. You could, in fact, make several sweeping comments concerning it, all of them quite justified. The most obvious is the way this photograph exemplifies the growing use and acceptance of color in art photography during the 1970s. Eggleston belonged to a color cadre of young and talented photographers. Stephen Shore. Joel Meyerowitz, Richard Misrock, Joel Sternfeld, and Eggleston's friend and fellow Southerner, William Christenberry. For what it's worth, Eggleston has said that he dreams in color. Make of that what you will. Notice how all of those images, other than Eggleston's, extend a pre-existing photographic tradition or body of work rather than depart from one. Sure in his road pictures, continues the simultaneous examination and celebration of the American landscape that dates back to Timothy O'Sullivan and William Henry Jackson in the years just after the Civil War. Color, among many other things, finally put the sky on an equal footing with terrain photographically. Myrowitz uses color to add a new layer of information to that grittiest and most muscular of 20th century genres, street photography. The curious thing is that color, in making even denser the array of information that is a city street, works to dampen the impact visually. It functions, you might say, as a form of gentrification. Misrak follows in the line of nature photography that Elliot Porter had already introduced to color. In rendering nature, color is as essential in doing justice to its subject matter as it is in rendering fashion. Soon enough, Misrock would add his own innovations to nature photography, monumentality, and an affinity for what one might call the apocalyptic sublime. What one notices first with the Sternfeld is the chromatic rhyme of flame and pumpkin. How could you not notice it? It's wonderful. Wonderful, I admit, doesn't offer much in the way of descriptive precision, but what it lacks in critical rigor, it more than makes up with accuracy. Those shades of orange are wonderful. Try, though, to ignore them for a moment to take in the geometry of the picture. You get an image of almost classical formality. You get the parallel lines of the pumpkin pile, the parallel line of the eaves of the farm stand roof. You get the apple trees. You get the eaves of the burning house. 
we get the parallel between the uh, firefighter's ladder, the plume of smoke. <clears throat> you also get, how can I forget, uh, the way the pumpkin purchaser uh, stands at a right angle to those planes. It's as if he's wandered in from a freeze, except that figures in freezes don't wander, let alone purchase produce. Walker Evans couldn't have produced, excuse me, couldn't have photographed this scene more fastidiously. Christenberry has often spoken of how Evans, as mentor and friend, as well as connoisseur of signage and documenter of the rural South, was his point of departure as a photographer. Seeing this photograph after the Sternfeld, that one with the vividness of its single dominant color, this one with the delicacy and modulation of its colors, reminds us that as a visual property, color can rival form in variety and even surpass it. But the Eggleston belongs to what tradition exactly? Or even inexactly? Part of what makes the tricycle so arresting and so offensive to a Mandarin sensibility like Hilton Kramer's is how it seems to come out of nowhere, or at least nowhere photographically. It probably came out of a basement or a garage. To the extent Eggleston's photograph has any artistic antecedents, they lie in pop art. 35 years ago, someone simply glancing at this photograph might have been forgiven for thinking it a record of a maquette for a Klaus Oldenburg sculpture or a prop for a Red Groom's installation. Ruckus Memphis, <laughs> let us say. Apart from art, Eggleston's photograph also can be seen as a touchstone for the growing acceptance and prominence of quotidian white southernness in the culture at large. This was evident in everything from the contemporary popularity of such rock bands as the Allman Brothers and Leonard Skinner to Richard Nixon's Southern strategy, to the election of Jimmy Carter in the same year that William Eggleston's guide was exhibited. Let's face it, seen strictly in terms of high culture, cracking MoMA was even a more daunting challenge than making it into the White House. Finally, this picture of a rather forlorn looking, ch looking child's toy, oops, sorry, you'll notice the rusted handlebars Sitting by itself in a nearly treeless subdivision, though closer inspection does reveal a few leafless trees in the background, though that seems to make things even bleaker, is a visual correlative for the imaginative uses to which banality was being put in the fiction of such writers of the 70s and 80s as Ian Beatty, Richard Ford, and Raymond Carver. As the curator Walter Hopps wrote in the citation when Eggleston won the 1998 Hasselblad Award, his quote, Photographs carry the enriched reverberations of fiction. I like that, don't you? Enriched reverberations of fiction. Hobbes is definitely onto something. Think of what Carver might have done with Eggleston's tricycle as a point of departure for a short story. This is dirty realism on the hoof, or certainly wheel. But instead of seeing Eggleston's photograph, <coughs> excuse me, in any of these larger or emblematic ways, I'd like to look at it on its own most basic terms. It's a tricycle, right? And part of what makes this photograph so striking is that even now it seems to have emerged out of an aesthetic void. And 35 years ago, it must have seemed very nearly unfathomable artistically. Even Oldenburg never reached so far, or should that be stooped so low, as to render a giant trike. Actually, though, this photograph didn't come out of nowhere, and I want to talk about it alongside three less well-known, but by no means obscure photographs of tricycles that preceded it. Two years before Eggleston's MoMA show, Tchaikovsky wrote these words for the catalog of an exhibition of new Japanese photographs. Most of the meanings of any picture reside in its relationships to countless other and earlier pictures, to tradition. It is the tricycle tradition, such as it is, that I want to explore. And that tradition is this lecture's other before, a much smaller one, but not without its rewards, as I hope to show. The invention of photography in the middle third of the 19th century was, as we know, part of a general wave of innovation in technology whose consequences we continue to experience today. Transportation was one of the most obvious and useful forms that innovation took. We don't think of Stieglitz, for example, as being especially enamored of either technology or transportation. Yet note the tracks and train in the hand of man, the mighty bulk of the Mauritania, the Detroit provided background in Georgia O'Keeffe's hands in front of a Ford V8, a Ford V8 that O'Keeffe had just bought. I wonder if there was such a thing as new car smell back then. Or this velocipede, 
more familiarly known as a bone shaker, Stieglitz's own, uh, in his photograph, My Room, taken when he was living in Berlin as a young man. Make no mistake, bicycles were very much seen as a technological innovation, and their popularity swept Europe and America in the 1890s when the safety bicycle, the immediate forerunner of the version ridden today, replaced bone shakers. And why shouldn't bicycle mania have swept much of the planet? Offering self-propulsion, swift or leisurely, as the rider sees fit, the bicycle has a romance to it, sometimes sweet and endearing, as in a bicycle built for two, more often sleek and bracing, as with racing bicycles. The strange world of the six-day races and the marvels of the road racing in the mountains, as Hemingway writes in A Movable Feast. This photograph by Jacques-Henri Lartigue from 1908 gives some sense of that uh, aspect of bicycling. There is, however, no romance or mystique to the tricycle. It is to the bicycle as margarine is to butter, as weed to flour, as New Jersey to New York. <laughs> no, as Delaware to New York. You can spend $10,000 on a racing bike, and it would be money well spent. There is no such thing as a racing trike. Even if there were, solid gold handlebars and diamond studded pedals couldn't get the price into five figures. A bicycle is a neo-Euclidean arrangement of circle and line, revolution and thrust. It is inherently even breathtakingly elegant, as a tricycle most definitely is not. Marcel Duchamp's ready-made is pure, spare, sculptural, not words one would ever apply to a tricycle wheel, which is all function and no form. A tricycle is never an object divorced from functional space, as bicycles and their motorized kin motorcycles can be. Haven't both found their way into museums and galleries to be admired by discerning and perhaps also nonplussed art goers? A tricycle, in contrast, just is. That the first one dates back to 1680 makes it venerable. That does not mean the tricycle is venerated. The masterpiece of Italian neorealism is called Bicycle Thief, not Tricycle Thief. <laughs> Amarillo Slim never bluffed his way to a fortune holding tricycle playing cards. In Graham Greene's The Quiet American, the narrator expresses this way his dread of what lies in store for him back in England. I could see so well the kind of house that has no mercy. A broken tricycle stood in the hall. If a tricycle carries a rider into purgatory, then a broken one carries him into hell. In contrast, one need only look at a few photographs to appreciate a bicycle's mercy-bringing beauty. The corkscrew velocity of Cartier-Bresson's cyclist is almost palpable. You can feel the wind in his hair, and perhaps your own. Notice the quality of mystery imparted by the bicycle in the background of Jerome Liebling's mother and child, Malaga. There's a lonely nobility unto that of a loyal steed in Andre Cortez's bike stand. A different kind of loneliness fills this image by Bill Brandt. That loneliness is the sum of formality, the man's attire, and incongruity, again, his attire. Yet for all that bicycles are commonplace, they also suggest a degree of cosmopolitanism as in Elliot Erwitt's photograph here. Baguette, barres, bicyclette, c'est formidable et magnifique. <laughs> Finally, transcending the merely cosmopolitan, bicycles can reach Empyrean heights, a conveyance befitting the heavenly host, or so Joseph Kadelka would have us believe. In contrast, I can think of just two notable examples of tricycles registering in the popular imagination. At one extreme, there are the quite astonishing tracking shots in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Kubrick was clearly having as much fun with a steady cam in them, still a filmmaking novelty at the time, as Danny, the little boy, is having riding his big wheel through the Overlook Hotel. And let's see if we can see a brief snippet from The Shining with Danny. Hear it. change in sound when he goes from bare rug to floor, floor to bare rug, and so forth. 
uh, I think that may be the most subtly unnerving effect in that extremely unnerving film. Uh, some of you likely know that Kubrick was quite a good photojournalist for Life, excuse me, for Look magazine, an important difference, those of us of a certain age will remember, before becoming a film director. Uh, his photographic past informs his filmmaking present here. You will, those of you who've seen the film will recall this image of these two little girls who appear as a ghostly vision to Danny. Uh, and they are an homage from Kubrick to Diane Arbus, a friend from Look Days. At the other extreme, in tricycle terms, uh, there's that recurring sight gag from the old TV show Roan and Martin's Laugh-In. A man in a sou'wester topples over with endless variations of failure as he tries to ride a tricycle. He is a sort of Sisyphus on three wheels, doomed to a gravity-plagued downfall. If his knees are any higher, they'd bash his chin. His play reminds us that, like a banana peel, like a whoopee cushion, like a mother-in-law, a tricycle is inherently comic an accident waiting to happen. Of course, that description does not apply to my own mother-in-law or to my wife's mother-in-law. Uh, I will add one further caveat. Tricycles are inherently comic in an adult context. The almost antic ordinariness of a tricycle seems so ridiculous precisely because it belongs not to the world of grown-ups, but that of children. Tricycles, inexpensive, clumsy, safely low to the ground, provide preschoolers or even toddlers with their first hesitant introduction to self-propelled vehicular motion. For that very reason, they are not objects one associates with urban settings. The idea of traffic is anathema to tricycles. Those familiar images that we all know of streets in Amsterdam or Beijing filled with cyclists, it goes without saying that they are bicyclists, not tricyclists. They have to be. Cities are about density on sidewalk as well as street. Having a tricycle in, on either location is asking for trouble. Other non-motorized wheel vehicles, fine. Baby carriages, push carts, bicycles, even ones with unprepossessing riders. Just because bicycles are inherently elegant does not mean that their riders must be too. <laughs> Leave it to Helen Levitt, who took the three preceding pictures to find a tricycle in the city. She is our, actually, since it's not really the focus of it, you might not miss it, but there is our tricyclist. <coughs> Excuse me. She is our photographic poet of urban life, more specifically our Wordsworthian photographic poet. Not that Wordsworth preferred London to the Lake District, rather it's Levitt's affinity with children that he would have appreciated. It was a singularly urban affinity. As her contemporaries, Richard Rogers and Lawrence Hart, proclaim in Manhattan, that anthem of Gotham romance, the great big city's a wondrous toy, just made for a girl and boy. Levitt gives us Manhattan girls and Manhattan boys back from when Manhattan really was Manhattan. Kids neither sweet nor sour, unillusioned but still innocent, on the loose without being on the prowl. People think I love children, but I don't not more than the next person, Levitt once said. It was just the children were out in the street or on the sidewalk. That trike does look a bit odd there, plumb in the middle of the photograph, but it's a lot less odd than the empty wooden frame that surrounds it, as you can see. Presumably, it normally held a mirror, a nicely surreal touch along with the visual pun of one frame being situated within another, that of the picture itself. What isn't odd is the group of kids. They're as natural as pastrami on rye or the Bronx being up and the battery down. One kid crouches, another bends. Others look this way and that, doing what kids do, which is to say nothing much in particular. They're actors in an unwritten play, one in which the tricycle's role is strictly walk on, or better yet, ride on. The trike is incidental at best. That empty frame in the middle matters more than whatever it might surround. In fact, the frame would look even more interesting if it enclosed a void a ready-made Magritte in Manhattan, you might say. But painters enjoy imaginative possibilities denied the practitioner of straight photography. Clear-eyed and practical as she was, Levitt understood that you take your objet trouvé as you trouve them. <laughs> if Levitt is our urban poet, then Gary Winogrand is our urban omnivore, a visual devourer of cities. A visual devourer of pretty much anything, actually. John Tchaikovsky estimates that during the final six years of his life, Winogrand made something like 350,000 exposures that he never even looked at. You didn't miss here. 350,000 exposures never even looked at. 
When a grand makes his closest verbal counterpart, Joyce Carol Oates, seem laconic by comparison. All things are photographable, he once said. He spent a career trying to prove it. But since cities have so much more of everything and anything, they're a good place to start with Winogrand. So one associates him with cities, his native New York, of course, but also Los Angeles and Miami and Dallas. And one also associ associates him with animals. The Animals is the title of his first book. And Women, Women Are Beautiful, is the title of his second book. And cities and animals and women all at once. <laughs> Let Magritte in Manhattan try to come up with something as good as that. What one doesn't much associate with Winogrand is children or open spaces, yet here we have this. It's 1959, somewhere within the Albuquerque city limits. Not that there's anything metropolitan about this picture. The photograph is a version of landscape. It could be a forerunner of Robert Adams' melancholy elegies to the subdividing of the Mountain West. You will note the cropped presence of a bicycle in the left-hand corner. Bicycles are everywhere. A tricycle implies certain things about whatever landscape or cityscape it belongs to. For starters, it has to be populated. That's obvious enough. And at least some of the populace will be rather young, as in the Winogrand, or as with the gang in the Levitt. It also has to be at least somewhat affluent. Why do I say that? Well, we'd be shocked to learn, for example, that any of the children in Lang's migrant mother owned a tricycle. A tricycle is simply not a necessity, as in contrast, a bicycle can be. Recall the dire consequences of a bicycle's disappearance in Bicycle Thief, or the burden-bearing function a bicycle serves in Brant's coal searcher going home to Jarrow. The emptiness of Winogrand's landscape, its openness, really, is in such contrast to Levitt's cityscape. There's no gang of kids here, that's for sure, though there is another child uh, just visible there in the background, and there's also the other tricycle there on the driveway. What's most noticeable about the photograph is neither of those things, though. What stays with you is the way the arrested pose almost makes the child seem to be dancing in the driveway. In the late 60s and early 70s, Bill Owens worked as a photographer for a small California newspaper, the Livermore Independent News. No landscape fills this photograph of his other than a patch of sidewalk and street. If anything, they're even more of a stage than Winogrand's driveway is, though you can bet that Richie don't dance. That's Richie in the picture. The photograph is from Owen's 1972 collection, Suburbia. Suburbia is locale, being to tricycles what Daytona is to stock cars, and Churchill Downs to thoroughbreds. This, that book's best known image is probably this one. We see an old Ronald Reagan movie on the TV next to Christmas presents under the tree. Everyday American weirdness doesn't come any sturdier than that. Or does it? The return of Richie suggests otherwise. Here's what his mother said about him, her description providing Owens with the photograph's caption. I don't feel that Richie playing with guns will have a negative effect on his personality. He already wants to be a policeman. His childhood gun playing won't make him a cop shooter. By playing with guns, he learns to socialize with other children. I find the neighbors who are offended by Richie's gun, either the father hunts, or the kids are the first to take Richie's gun and go off and play with it. Truly, there is no love like a mother's love. <laughs> this is the Bay Area, circa 1971, which is to say in the afterwash of the 60s. But it's the Livermore 60s, not the Berkeley 60s. The two cities are only 32 miles apart. Back then, at least, for all that they had in common, they could have been orbiting in different solar systems. Richie's tricycle, another big wheel, like Danny's in The Shining, dominates the image, but it's about Richie, isn't it? Rider rather than mount. What you remember from the picture is that look on his face. All right, the look on his face and the gun. There are other famous photographs of toy gun wielders. This is from Helen Levitt, William Klein, and there's also, if you want to be agnostic as regards weaponry, Arbus's boy with a toy hand grenade. More power to him, I say, but the smart money in any showdown is on Richie. Incidentally, Owen Edwards, that fine writer on photography and design, has an update in the October issue of Smithsonian Magazine on Owens and Ritchie. But back to Ritchie. He owns this piece of territory. That, <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> that toddler in Winogrand's picture looks so out of place as almost to seem alien. And lest we forget, Roswell is not that far from Albuquerque. What helps to create that effect is how paleness of skin and whiteness of diaper and shirt so sharply contrast with the shadowed interior of the garage. 
call it Sunbelt Kiriskuru. No, Richie looks, and I like that too. I wrote it on the, on the, on the plane this morning. Uh, no, that's, please, let's show some respect to Richie. Richie looks very much at home, as a warden might on the grounds of his penitentiary, <laughs> or a big game hunter cycling along the savannah. The tricycle, it must be said, is pretty much beside the point. It's just a way for him to take a load off his feet. Given a choice between gun and trike, you know damn well which one he'd pick. <laughs> that said, it is his trike, and don't you forget it. Part of the mystery and allure of Eggleston's tricycle is how its ownership is not only unknown, but irrelevant. It exists by itself, for itself, through itself. Not to get too Kantian, but if ever a Dingan Sikh existed within a photographic frame, this is it. The emptiness in Owen's photo is openness. Openness that offers room for Richie to move, room to take aim, too. The openness in the Eggleston is a setting, as of proscenium for soliloquy, velvet for jewel, or more aptly, perhaps, velour for zircon. There's a long tradition of homely objects being photographed, but they are finely wrought homely objects, like Ralph Steiner's wicker rocking chair, American Rural Baroque. If the title weren't a dead giveaway, the filigreed shadow would be. Or they are nobly homely, noble homely objects, as in the exquisite portfolio of hand tools Walker Evans made for Fortune in 1955, or this photograph he took of battered trash cans in Manhattan from 1935. Eggleston's tricycle is different. It's simultaneously less than homely, it's mass-manufactured mundane, and it's exalted. One way Eggleston achieves the effect is obvious. He shoots the tricycle from a low angle. It looms large in the imagination because it looms large, period. We're looking up, heavenward, if you will. Eggleston's camera bestows in that tricycle the majesty and inexplicability of an archangel's throne. Angels can ride all the bicycles they want, Peche Kudelka, but trikes are the preserve of Gabriel and Michael and the rest, or at least they are, with Eggleston behind the camera. No one can evoke the enchantment of the banal quite so well. He imbues the everyday with a sense of cool, uninflected mystery. I am at war with the obvious, he has said. In that war, Eggleston is at once field marshal and berserker. He wages it as frontal assault and siege, a verdun of the diurnal, domestic, and demotic, maybe the demented, too. These contents of a freezer might sustain a polar expedition otherwise reduced to cannibalism. This bathroom tile could be an arrangement of grout-lined jade. An in-flight cocktail sits in its plastic chalice, giving off a sacerdotal radiance. Swizzle stick is salvation. The three previous tricycle photos all have people in them. One is a cityscape. One is, for all intents and purposes, a landscape. One is a portrait, Richie Rex. In each, the tricycle is visually subsidiary and utilitarian in application. It's a toy, a ludic tool. There's nothing aesthetic about it. It's simply a means to an end. Motion for the kid, visual variety for the photographer. With Eggleston, things stand quite otherwise. This is an object. Beyond objet trouvé, objet sacré. Nearly Martian in its mundaneness, a tricycle looks so normal in the three-dimensional world, yet so bizarre within a two-dimensional frame. Speaking of frames, notice how nicely Eggleston frames that car with these wheels. Out of that inversion of three-dimensional normality and two-dimensional bizarreness, Eggleston creates a tension that simultaneously defeats our expectations and sustains our interest. The tricycle does not stand alone, of course. You also find those two ranch houses and car in the background. You also have a patch of dead grass, some asphalt, and a mess of gray sky. The entire scene is all very well negligible. Or is it? The grass and asphalt almost eerily mirror the sky as neutral space. The trike is shot in such a way as to dominate the foreground, like a chariot of very youthful gods. I keep coming back somehow to religion. For Eggleston, the profane is what's sacred, artistically anyway. The many curves of the bicycle, the seat, that's gonna, is this working here? Uh, well, you can see it, the seat, the handlebars, the stem, the frame, the mud guards, they mock the angularity of the house roofs to the rear. Then there's the chromatic play of red handle grips with bluish green seat and frame, not forgetting that white bit on the stem and part of the frame, or that, yes, 
those tires are white walls, or at least the wheel rims are white. The whiteness of each playing off of the roof and trim of the houses behind. Color is absolutely not an afterthought here. Eggleston started out as a black and white photographer, a good one too, inspired in part by Cartier-Bresson. There's a pleasing symmetry in that pairing, the master of the decisive moment helping produce the master of the democratic object. The point is Eggleston embraced color photography consciously, aware of how much a richer palette would bring to his art. It doesn't always work that way. Remember Levitt's chunkster cyclist. It's not just because he looks like such a schlub that that picture and Levitt's color photography generally from the 60s and 70s can't compare to her black and white work from the 30s and 40s. Or the Meyerowitz street scene we saw earlier would, I would contend, benefit from having been in black and white. That is not at all the case here. Remove its color and you severely diminish the effect of this photograph. In its subdued way, Eggleston's palette looks almost as luscious as that beverage service cocktail. The whole thing is a model of unobtrusive artistry and the everyday nondescript. It seems so simple and artless. Looked at closely, however, it's as cunning as a seduction, as ordered as a sonnet. How to account for such a miracle of seeing and recording? One could start with autobiography. Rainer Holzmeier's 2008 documentary, William Eggleston Photographer, includes this black and white family snapshot. That's a very young Eggleston in the foreground, looking natty in cap and sailor suit, and one assumes the tricycle is his. Might it be a wheeled equivalent of Charles Foster Kane's rosebud? <laughs> Surely not even Eggleston can say. In such indeterminacy begins the mystery and wonder of art, three-wheeled and otherwise. A lot of art is just a notation of loving something, Ed Ruscha has said. Doesn't really matter what it is. Ruscha said that to Dave Hickey, that sly and marvelous critic who last year delivered this lecture. Ruscha is absolutely right. The what really doesn't matter in the least, and that applies even to a lowly tricycle. <coughs> Excuse me. And in fact, I suppose that lowly is redundant in front of tricycle. What matters in art isn't what, or for, or for that matter, when, who, where, or why. It's how, first, last, and always. If there is any great lesson to be drawn from this lecture, it is in its underscoring of the oldest and most easily overlooked truth in art history. Content may enable, whether it be a pope's face, a painter's mother, or yes, a battered, bicycle, battered tricycle, but it's style that endures. Well, in conclusion, let me add a researcher's footnote. Long after this lecture title was announced and well into the preparation of a text, I chanced upon not one, but two additions to our three-wheeled canon. Bruce Davidson's New York street scene from 1962, I believe, could be kin or neighbor to Levitt's photograph. Again, the tricycle hardly matters in what's going on. It's just part of the scene. But there it is, three wheels and all. There's nothing incidental about the tricycle in this other photograph, a spooky, magnificent Polaroid from Andre Cortez taken in 1979. Now let's ponder this. That's three years after William Eggleston's guide. Check. It's a tricycle. Check. It's in color. Check. And it has, offers a presentation positively Wagnerian. You could call this Twilight of the Tricycles. <laughs> coming, coming from the most Mozartian of photographers. All of this is highly peculiar. Surely, Cortez intended a riposte to Eggleston. Or did he? I don't know. I do know that in its lofty solitude, staring off at the sunset, forget Archangel's throne, this is Archangel transubstantiated into tricycle, the image both distantly recalls and disdainfully rebukes that lonely bicycle in that Cortez photograph we saw earlier. So, with those two further additions, we now have six photographers on three wheels. Who knows how many more remain to be noticed? I can only conclude that with the photographing of tricycles, as of making many books, there is no end. No matter how many times that poor fellow on Laugh-In, you remember the sight gag I mentioned earlier, no matter how many times he tips over, he always rises up to pedal again, no less indomitable for being doomed. First we fail, excuse me, first I just failed. First we feel, Joyce wrote in Finnegan's Wake, then we fall. Sometimes we photograph, too. Nietzsche had his myth of the eternal return. I prefer another, 
that of the eternal tricycle. Thank you all very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm wondering if you think its triangularity might contribute to its iconic status by connecting it to so many classic works of art over the ages. That's a very good question. Let's go back. There it is. Let's keep it up there. Um, well, as you know, three is a sacred number, a sacred and mystical number. Um, and maybe so. Uh, part of the reason I think that I, I came up with this lecture, this is a subject for a lecture, is that I've always loved this photograph, but I can't figure out why. Uh, and in fact, it's quite uh, anomalous for me in that I much prefer black and white photography. Uh, I prefer um, you know, photographs from the, from the middle decades of the last century. But this one just sticks with me. And that's a very good speculation. And I dare say it's part of it, but I can't begin to plumb the wall. I mean, he, uh, we, he does the how, we do the why, uh, and I've still got a long way to go on the why. Other questions? I, too, have been intrigued by this photograph for many, many years. And uh, for me, though, the seat position mm -hmm. is so awkward. Yes. And, and the, that shaft coming straight down from the seat has <laughs> always been an anchor for me as well for this picture. It's part of the enigma. And I didn't know if you had ever kind of speculated on that. The, the sure. Um, one of the things that uh, journalism teaches you is to never overlook the obvious. In fact, I have a friend who's a psychologist who frequently will say to me, uh, accusingly, that as a journalist, you have a keen grasp of the obvious, and I take that as a compliment. Um, I suspect the shaft is there simply to make it easier to pick it up and move it around, since those, you know, we, those of us who had tricycles or rode them when young don't remember the logistics of them, but those of us who have had children who have ridden tricycles certainly know uh, how useful it can be to just pick up the things and throw them in the back of a car or throw them on a porch or what have you. I suspect that's what the shaft is about. Uh, and as regards the seemingly odd angle at which the seat is placed, I think that that's to make it easier to reach the pedals on the front wheel. You know, uh, those of us who have outgrown tricycles tend to forget that that's where the pedals are on a bicycle. But on a trike, it's the wheels. It's not a chain, but it's the wheels that you're turning. And to get to them, I think, I haven't done the ergonomics on this, but I think that that angle would make it easier. I don't know. And I guess thank that's you. it. So thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>